with public safety, there's a limit to that. I can certainly hire bodyguards. I can live in a gated community. I can drive an armored vehicle. But at the end of the day, I will live in fear of victimization day in and day out. And this will affect not only myself, my family, psychological, physical well-being, but also my, my bottom line, right? My firms, my companies, and so on. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. There are numerous drivers of state building that generate a sense of urgency among elites to accept higher tax burdens than they otherwise would. This is particularly the case in crises induced by economic challenges, national security threats, and natural disasters. But while many Latin American states have experienced severe public safety crises in the context of fiscal duress, elite engagement in state building has taken place in some places, but not in others. Why is that the case? In explaining the adoption of elite taxes for public safety, my guest argues that the conventional crisis-centered explanations are insufficient. Whereas economic elites are generally reluctant to shoulder a greater tax burden, public safety crises can soften this opposition when they affect elites directly and thereby open the door to negotiations with the government. However, the deterioration of public safety conditions is not enough to elicit elite taxation. Rather, the resulting tax arrangement will depend on the strength of business-government linkages in the form of formal and informal collaboration mechanisms. When linkages are weak, elite taxation is likely to fail, if attempted at all. Stronger linkages will make elite taxation more likely. Gustavo Flores Macias is a professor of government and public policy and associate vice provost for international affairs at Cornell University. His latest book is Contemporary State Building, Elite Taxation and Public Safety in Latin America. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome to the show, Gustavo. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you for having me, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Let's start by discussing something that one often reads in the literature, and that is that Latin American states are often termed to be this middle-of-the-road states. They don't risk collapse in the immediate future, but there are many, some would say, profound institutional weaknesses. And so you have a law enforcement service that exists on paper. You have a police, but they sometimes or often, some people say, underperform. The same can be said of tax authorities. There's a willingness to undertake tax reforms, but the rhetoric perhaps does not match the reality. What can you say about contemporary state building in Latin America? What do you think has really changed and what remains, in your view, as some form of unfinished business? Yeah, no, I think that's a wonderful question. And, and uh, you know, let me start by saying that I think Latin America has been characterized as the middle class of the world. And, and I think this applies in many respects to the strength of the state, right? And, and, you know, we can think of state capacity as government's ability to get things done, whether this means the ability to vaccinate um, their populations or perhaps the ability to, you know, carry on economic policies. Certainly it has to do with um, the type of bureaucracies, the quality of, of bureaucrats, the education and all these things. But in, in terms of, you know, Latin America, certainly one would argue is not in the category of failed states or states that are really struggling to deliver the most basic services, like collecting trash and so on. But it's also not in the category of, of governments where clearly everything works, you know, service delivery and health services and education, everything works very well. 
like maybe in parts in Northern Europe or elsewhere. So contemporary state building in Latin America, I think has so many dimensions because there are unfinished tasks across the board. And we can think of public safety as one of them. We can think of uh, even the ability to collect tax revenue from you know, the population. We can think of the ability to deliver health services. We can think of the ability to deliver education, public education. There are so many areas in which Latin American countries still have a lot of work to do. And I think uh, what is what is important is that there's a lot of variation within the region as well. So you can find some countries that are very, maybe better at doing one thing than another. You can think of maybe Brazil, a country that is very good at collecting taxes compared to most other countries in the region. But let's say it's not as good as spending it in public education. It spends a lot of money, but the outcomes are not all that good. You can have maybe a place like Haiti, where you, you know, Haiti struggles to deliver some of the most basic services, maybe even trash collection or delivering the mail. So, you know, clearly a lot of variation within the region. But for the most part, I think it's safe to say that it's like a middle class trying to get to that next level of development and the ability to deliver better quality services. But also, you know, there's no guarantee this will happen. A lot of countries are just struggling not to fall behind even more and try to keep up with other parts of the world that are clearly making progress along these lines. This brings me to a concept that, as I mentioned to you earlier, my colleague Benedicta Bull is interested in the role of elites of different types in state building, which is also something that you focus on in your excellent book, so let's talk about the role of elites or economic elites in state building. Now, in many parts of the world, elites have played a very important positive role. You mentioned Western Europe. There has been considerable interest in, in elite support for the welfare state to pay your share of taxes. It could be also in relation to certain crises that lead to elites doing more than their fair share or at least be willing to pay taxes and do other stuff. But in other parts of the world, and this is where Latin America becomes interesting, there is the projection, at least many would say that Latin America is one of inequality. You know, you think about elites as in some super rich people, you know, you have all this popular media projection in films, etc. You have landowners, very rich people, and then you have poor people, and of course, you have middle class, etc. Before we talk about the, the positive or even the negative aspects or the, the contributions of economic elites in state building, Gustavo, I would like to understand how you understand the concept of economic elites in a Latin American context. Who are these elites, Gustavo? I'd like to know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm glad you bring up the work of Benedict Bo because she's, you know, her work has has really been influential to to me and and for the completion of this book. And I, you know, I think of these elites in the context of Latin America as those sectors of society that really control uh, most of the economic resources. And as you pointed out, uh, Latin America is a fairly unequal part of the world. There's a lot of um, wealth inequality and wealth is highly, highly, highly concentrated. So this means that we're really speaking of about, you know, the top 5% of the population in terms of, of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, these are people that often, you know, a lot of the main companies in Latin America are dominated by a handful of families. And, you know, they transfer wealth from one generation to the next, and they sit on the boards of these companies. And, you know, I'm, it's not to say that every company is like that. A lot of, especially multinationals have, I think, changed some of that and have both modernized and internationalized ownership in, in Latin America. But what we're really thinking about, if we think of the top 5% of the wealthiest people in the region that ultimately have really the power and the resources to try to circumvent tax obligations. And this is, this is something that is not only true about Latin America. This happens everywhere in the world. People 
hate paying taxes. I think a lot of people understand the the need to pay taxes from a from a societal point of view to make things work, right? But when you have this sort of middle class type of country in in Latin America, in again middle class is thinking about the world, right? And, and it's a place in which things sort of work, but they don't work really well. And and a lot of these elites are thinking, well, why should I contribute more if government services don't really work for me? They sort of work, but not all that well. Um, so, you know, these are people that are, are thinking about what they are contributing to society in taxes. They often contribute a lot in taxes in spite of sort of, um, you know, the rhetoric and the sort of the animosity toward economic elites. Just to give you a sense, in many parts of Latin America, only about somewhere between 5 and 10% of the population pays income taxes. And, and the rest tends to be just indirect taxes, sort of value-added taxes or sales taxes, consum consumption taxes. But those who do pay income taxes, it's often these elites and the companies that they own. So those are the people I have in mind. And the reason why I think they're important in this story is because they have both the wealth that often governments need to improve those services that they provide, from public safety to education, but also they have the ability to circumvent these obligations, right? They can, they can not only hire, let's say, accountants and lobbyists and lawyers to try to figure out how to pay less in taxes. They often have the ability to just talk to those in positions of power directly, right? Often they're good friends or even relatives who might be running the show, right, in office at any given time. And they are also the ones that have the ability to maybe take their money elsewhere, take it out of the country and shelter the money in other parts of the world, maybe where tax obligations might be lower. So that's a long way of saying, you know, these are the people that play an important role in this tax bill, in this state building story today. And they are the ones that are very reluctant to contribute more but given the right circumstances, can be compelled to do so. I think the relationship between economic and political elites is interesting because sometimes they may be the same group of people. You could have economic power and political power and vice versa. If, you know, you can get politicians to enact certain legislation that prevents you from giving more money to the state purse, that is your main goal, I suppose, if you're an economic elite. I see in your work that it isn't always the negative aspects. Elites have actually contributed in many parts of Latin America, contributed in a positive way to state building. I'm thinking about in Colombia, El Salvador, in Guatemala, in the post-conflict period, they have played an important role. In Mexico, economic elites were crucial in the construction of the post-revolutionary state, even though the jury is still out and many disagreements exist in terms of their contribution to stabilizing development in the 50s and 60s. So there is that positive contribution. And yet, as I understand it, Gustavo, in the Latin American context, a lot of scholars tend to argue that it is really difficult, as you just mentioned, to engage elites in this state building project compared to maybe elites in other parts of the world. And this is even difficult when certain big crises such as wars take place, which, which I find quite fascinating. So the literature, as I see it on state building in Latin America, tends to say that elites are a big obstacle. They actually prevent state building. They don't facilitate. They're not conducive to state building. Why do you think that is the case in Latin America? You know, it's important to point out that elites, it's not that elites participate in a state building project out of goodwill, I don't think. I don't think it's uh, a moral imperative that they feel or a duty to contribute to society. It's just selfish interest. <laughs> Well, yes, at the end of the day, they have to see value in engaging in the state building project. And especially because often this project will mean concentrated costs for elites and diffuse benefits that may or may not accrue. And if they do accrue, they accrue to society. I think it's also important to point out that 
one may agree or disagree with elites projects you know after the mexican revolution one could agree or disagree with with a project that ended up winning in the end sort of this this constitutionalist project but but at the end of the day without elites in the mix i think it would have been hard to move that project forward and this is true you know in, in mexico after the revolution but also in in central america after the civil wars in the 1980s and 90s and and elsewhere so elites are necessary and the question is well what type of project would emerge and sometimes we really don't agree with those projects sometimes they're very self-serving in in the contemporary period and the period of the book focuses on you know sort of the last 20 years, 30 years, you know, there's a real opportunity of state building with public safety crises. And this also does not mean that elites all of a sudden say, you know, there's this crisis of public safety, let me help out, let me become involved. There's so much reluctance, so much animosity. And I think part of it has to do with the mistrust toward governments mistrust that the, um, let's say, additional revenue from taxes that elites would contribute would actually go toward the intended purpose. There's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of waste, and economic elites are certainly mindful of that, even if they themselves might engage in corrupt practices, right? <laughs> right. So I think at the end of the day, governments have to make it clear that elites' interests will be advanced when elites are engaged in this state building project. And I don't mean this to, in a sinister way. You know, certainly, you know, one could agree or disagree with the fact that elites' interests should become a priority or not. But what is interesting in the context of public safety and crises of violent crime is that this tends to affect everyone. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, violent crime affects your everyday life. And, and this is certainly true for, for people who are not elites. But elites have nowhere to hide in a way. And this is something that makes public safety different from other types of public goods that the government may not be providing, you know, satisfactorily, let's say. So if, if I'm an elite and I am not in love with the public education system, chances are I can send my kids to a private school. If I am, you know, a wealthy person and I am, I do not want to rely on the, the public hospital, I can either go to a private hospital or I can even maybe fly to Miami or somewhere else and get that type of private care. But with public safety, there's a limit to that. I can certainly hire bodyguards. I can live in a gated community. I can drive an armored vehicle. But at the end of the day, I will live in fear of victimization day in and day out. And this will affect not only myself, my family, psychological, physical well-being, but also my, my bottom line, right? My yeah. firms, my companies, and so on. These are important, I think, points to consider in that elites, I think, are crucial to the state building enterprise. They are a group that needs to be convinced that it's important to invest in this goal. And the crisis of public safety or violent crime might present a window of opportunity to get them engaged. Much of what you say, Gustavo, applies to elites, I would argue, in Africa, in Asia. Many would launch or come up with similar arguments. Why should I pay taxes when I know the government is corrupt or is incompetent? It'll lead to more wastage. There's no point in me contributing. So what I do as an elite, I would try to build a wall around myself. I can try and protect my family, my close relatives. And as you said, I could buy myself better health care, better education. I can bypass the government. But basically, it seems to me in many parts of the world, elites tend to erect these walls. And this reminds me of the time I was in uh, Mexico City. What a beautiful city and some of the most fashionable neighborhoods. You could never really see 
the houses because there were these huge walls, these fences. And the same thing actually in um, Cape Town or Johannesburg. But I want to talk to you first about taxation before we talk about public safety. And in the book, you have a fascinating quote by a former minister of finance from Guatemala who was lamenting about the failure of tax reform, which is the taxation policy. He said, it is well known that in practice, Guatemalan companies keep three books. One that they show to the tax authorities where profits are low, losses are low. So you're basically, you know, making sure you don't attract undue attention and then you pay low taxes. And then you can also have another book where you actually want to get a loan from the bank. And there, of course, the profits are very high. But the true accounts, which is the third one, they're secret. And I think that itself is very illustrative of some of the challenges of implementing tax policy. But as I understand it, Gustavo, the legislative coalitions that one needs for economic reform, they've emerged in very uh, politically diverse and hotly debated political environments. And yet tax reforms or tax policy itself is often very contested and understudied. What then are the main determinants of fiscal reforms and elite taxation? Yeah, maybe we can start with the role of crises. I think crises are opportunities because they compel elites and really everyone to do things that maybe in regular times they would be very reluctant to do. And um, we can think of maybe differences. I don't know. Let's let's think about uh, the case of Ukraine and and the Russian invasion. Yeah, I'm guessing that you know I don't I'm not an expert on Ukraine by any means, but I'm guessing that there were political differences that were very salient before the war between different factions inside Ukraine that were absolutely set aside the minute that you had this invasion. And I'm not saying that they are com they completely disappear. They may be dormant for some time, but at least they become secondary and the imperative of resolving the crisis becomes, you know, the front of mind for everyone. I think the same thing might happen with other forms of crisis, even say natural disasters or say a crisis of public safety or, or a pandemic, a COVID emergency. And again, these, these differences don't disappear. I think the COVID pandemic is a good example in which things can become fairly politicized very quickly and, yeah. and disagreements do not go away. But at least, at least these barriers that exist in society become less prevalent and, and less meaningful to prevent society from moving toward a common goal. And I think this is something that you know, is happening in Latin America that helps governments collect more in taxes. Latin America is a region that collects very little in taxes compared to other parts of the world if we adjust for its level of development. So when we say, you know, this is what a particular level of development, this is the expectation that we would have that a country in that level of development would, would collect in taxes, Latin America tends to fall short by quite a bit. And most countries collect much less than is expected. The exception is perhaps Brazil, that tends to be right on the expected level, but not, not higher. In part, you know, there are different explanations for this. Uh, some people point to the high levels of inequality not helping this tax collection, right? Because people say, well, only the rich should pay taxes. So there's there's there are these factors of inequality that affect what is called tax morale, sort of this this willingness to pay taxes. So if if I live in a very unequal society and I'm poor, I say, well, the rich should pay. But the rich also say, look, we're already paying most of the taxes. Others should pay as well. So in Latin America, tax collection has always been an issue, and these crises, historically, what they've done is that they might bring down some of the barriers. Again, we can think of wars, we can think of natural disasters, and in this case, crisis of violent crime. It doesn't mean that governments will be able to convince people easily, but it does mean that governments might have a better, a, a better chance, a, at least a fighting chance, 
at getting people to pay more in taxes. And with the examples that we discussed, it's not that elites will say, okay, I'm going to pay exactly what I'm supposed to pay in taxes. I think even when they're convinced to pay more, there's still a lot that is underpaid. And, and the example you were giving the Minister of Finance in Guatemala is a good one, right? At the end of the day, even if at least sit down at the table with governments to pay more and contribute to, toward this state building enterprise, there's still a lot that is unreported. There's still a lot of that is, you know, moved to offshore instruments that I can use to, to evade taxes. But it's better than the alternative, which is even less flowing into government coffers. In many parts of the world, the big problems with taxation can be many, many factors. One could be a low tax base. The economy is largely informal in some parts of the world where we're talking about certain countries in uh, Southern Africa, a country that I study quite a lot, Malawi. The economy is small. There's an informal sector. The government doesn't really know who to tax, which I expect not to be a problem in Latin America, given bureaucratic capacity is, I would imagine, much more strong, just a bit like in India. Administrative capacity is, is quite strong. So in that sense, there may be other factors that prevent more successful uh, tax policy. The other aspect actually has to do with crises, as I see it, have to be visible. It has to feel personal for me to actually make a contribution. Now, if I do support as an economic elite, I find that there's a political elite in power that I can identify with, I may feel, irrespective of a crisis such as a war, I may feel that there's finally somebody in power that I can trust, and thereby there may be an emerging political settlement that elites agree upon saying, come on, let's all do our part because we finally have somebody in power that we know can deliver the goods. I think there's there's um, a lot of truth in what you've said in that elites, and I think everyone in society, tends to trust more those that are like themselves when they are in power. And, and this is, for example, the importance of, of having you know, different groups represented in parliament or, or in office, right, in the executive. And because people, this representation is important. And, and these people will then better understand the needs of those groups in society. In the case of elites, you know, it's, it's an interesting situation in Latin America, because I think, as in other parts of the, of the developing world, there can be a lot of state capture by elites, right? Yeah. It's not that elites tend to be underrepresented in government. And you were alluding to this early on, that their own family members are in power or they themselves are in power. So it would be hard to say that they're not represented. They often, through, let's say, campaign contributions, can finance political parties that squarely, squarely represent them in, in Congress, for instance. So... What, what is paradoxical here is that in spite of that representation and in spite of that, at times, capture of governments and executives, there is still this important mistrust because of the systemic corruption that is so widespread that then elites are not quite sure that what they're putting into the system is going to come back and benefit them. And that is one of the main challenges, I think, of state building in today's world, right? At least in the developing world. And that is finding ways to convince elites that it's worth becoming involved, but also ways that at the end of the day, tie government's hands so that they really pay attention to where the money is going. So that there is less corruption, that money is not embezzled, and at the end of the day, better policy outcomes that might benefit certainly elites, but other groups in society, right? And, and again, public safety is one in which, uh, fortunately, you are not only benefiting elites when you're providing better public safety, you are benefiting most groups, if not all. So this brings me to the heart and the, the main argument in your book, which is really trying to distinguish different types of public good provision 
such as healthcare and education that may not attract elite interest, but public safety is so in your face that you really have no other option but to react. And this is based on the fact that Latin America is one of the most violent regions of the world and homicide rates have increased dramatically. In the 21st century, I think you have some figures in the book about 300 homicides per day, even though this is actually from, say, five, six, seven years ago, 110,000 per year, more than 1.5 million between 2000 and 2015. So public safety situation is grim. But for the purposes of engaging elites in this state building enterprise, in order to give more money, extract more money from elites in terms of tax, et cetera, for, for state building, how do you, in your analysis, Gustavo, differentiate public safety from these other forms of welfare good provision, such as education and health? As you just said that Maybe something about public safety means it benefits everyone, including elites, whereas health and education, I suppose, elites can bypass and find another way out. Is, is that the reason that they feel like this is something that there's no way out? You know, you, you can have a lot of private security guards and stay in a gated community, but you still have to venture out of your, your secure neighborhood. Exactly. I think it really has to do with the extent to which people can substitute these goods privately in the private marketplace. And, you know, elites might still complain about private schools that they might not entirely, you know, they might not be thrilled with them, but but they can still shape those schools, you know, they can influence the curriculum, they can, you know, in Latin America, historically, a lot of the, a lot of, say, Catholic schools, were a response to this sense that the public school system was either not of enough quality or that they were teaching these, you know, sort of Marxist revolutionary ideas to kids and then the elites didn't want to have that as part of the curriculum. So they would just create their own schools. And, and this is true at all, all levels. You know, in, in Mexico, for example, the Tech de Monterrey, which is one of the the main private universities today, sort of an, an institute of technology of sorts in, in Mexico, emerge out of sort of business, business groups sense that the public educational system was just not training the people that they needed for their companies, right? So again, it, it can be for ideological reasons, it can be for religious reasons, it can be for a number of reasons. But at the end of the day, elites can provide these goods and substitute for these public goods in the private marketplace. But with public safety, there's a limit to that. And this is something that came up time after time in interviews with elites in different countries. And just the importance, you know, they could still invest their money elsewhere. They could still, you know, maybe move some of the relatives elsewhere, some of them to Miami, some of them to California. But there's really a limit to that. And there are a lot of things that are sometimes cultural sometimes social, that root elites in their countries, right? That, that at the end of the day, even for the wealthiest people in Latin America, it's not that easy to say, look, I'm just going to leave this country for good. And that's it. In part because their, their businesses are there, in part because that's their own culture, that's their own, you know, their family is there. Sometimes it's not that easy, even for elites to just pick up and leave for good. So this ability to substitute some goods but not others, this difference, is really, I think, at the heart of why elites are willing to sit down with governments and say, okay, let's, let's work towards solving this problem, but under certain conditions, right? So governments and elites have to agree on the right conditions that need to be on the table. And these are different depending on the country. But what you were saying earlier is so important, and that is that elites have to feel directly threatened by this. It's not enough for public safety to be bad in the country overall. If elites live, let's say, in a safe part of the country, well, then this public safety problem is someone else's problem, not elites. The security threats facing not just Latin America, but maybe also other parts of the world 
are so varied. You could have political protests, political movements, social movements, revolutionary movements in Colombia. You've had the FARC rebels. You have uh, ongoing movements that last for decades. The state is seen to be failing, perhaps, or making only small inroads. And then you have drug cartel, which reminds me of Narcos, the Netflix series. That is how, you know, my impression of some of the drug cartels are based on Narcos and Narcos Mexico, by the way, which I thought was even better than the original Narcos. I'm told by some of my colleagues in Latin America, some of the depictions are pretty real and they're not, you know, exaggerated as we would think they are. And so, Here we have a state grappling not just with regular crime, but a whole series of threats and elites, of course, also understanding these threats as something the state may or may not have the capacity to do something about. And there I found a puzzle in your book. I'm trying to sort of understand this is that if I'm an elite and I think the state has failed in education, in health, stuff that they should be able to do, why would I trust the state to do something about security? Even though a public threat of that kind affects me directly, it does not fundamentally, I would argue, change my perception of the state. I would still believe that they're incompetent. So what is it about public safety that that motivates, that catalyzes action that health and education do not. In different parts of Latin America, the public safety situation got so bad for elites that they couldn't really even travel from one city to another for family reasons or for business reasons, for whatever. So the case of Colombia in the early 2000s, I think is a good example, Mm -hmm. in which just the number of kidnappings taking place, targeting economic elites, was fairly significant. And it was taking place, you know, not only it was it was dangerous to fly by plane, to you know, travel by plane, it was dangerous to go by car, by bus, you know, all modes of transportation presented a risk. So when it gets to that point of, you know, the risk of being kidnapped or or killed really is is a non-trivial risk. I think elites are at least willing to give this a try. But again, I don't mean that this is every elite. I think the examples in Latin America suggest that even under the worst circumstances, there will be groups that say, I do not trust the government. I will not get involved. This is just not for me. I'd rather chance it privately, try to fix the problem myself. But there are other groups that at least are willing to give the government the benefit of the doubt. And there's also a sense that the private sector can do what the government is unable to do. You know, in in Mexico, for example, there's an important business elite in the northern city of Monterrey, close to the border with the United States. And it's so interesting that they, they really think the problem with public safety is that the government is in charge of it and the government is just not that competent and not that able to do this. So we're going to fix the problem. We're going to finance sort of this this almost parallel security force. Like a militia, a private militia? Yeah, I mean, in this case, you know, it was it was a state force. It was not operating outside of what the state was sanctioning, but they were working with the state and they said, look, let us do the recruiting because you, you're not able, you're incompetent. We'll we'll put all of our human resource personnel from all of our companies to do this for you. And we're going to make sure that these uh, police that we're recruiting are then well paid because you are not paying them enough. And, you know, all of these challenges that they've identified that they say, well, we'll take care of this. And you, you're still, you know, in charge of this, but we want to be so involved that we're going to run this well. And that same mentality permeates all of these cases in Latin America in which governments and elites were able to reach an agreement. And not everybody went along, but at least I think they got to a point where elites said, look, we want this as an ex- to be an experiment, let's say. So let's make it temporary. If you are going to adopt a tax on the wealthiest sectors, We want it to be a temporary tax. So let's put a sunset on this tax so that let's say for two years or three years or or four years. And then if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. The tax disappear. We're not, you know, we're not going to pay it. 
So that's one. Another important condition for elites was that taxes be earmarked for public safety. This was crucial for them because they didn't want just the revenue to go anywhere. And now, you know, this is tricky because at the end of the day, tax revenue can be fungible. Even if, I, if it's, I'm earmarking it for, for public safety, then maybe revenue that I would have used from the general fund for public safety, I can use for something else. And at the end of the day, there was no additional revenue going into public safety. But, but this is why there was a third condition that was also important to elites, and that was the ability to have real oversight mechanisms often involving elites themselves and members of civil society more generally, to oversee how the money was spent. In other words, to make sure that this money was going where it was meant to. So if you put these things together, the short time horizon of the tax, the earmarking, sort of this promise that it would go to something that was important to elites, and the ability to oversee directly how that money was spent, This convinced at least important sectors of the elite to say, okay, let's give this a try. And politically, the advantage of these types of taxes on the wealthy is that they're politically very desirable or or they're not problematic because the general population tends to to like the incidents. Yeah, nobody can be against this idea. Everybody wants security. I noticed that there's an enormous variation, as you also just mentioned, in the adoption of these security taxes in Latin America. And I found three or four categories of conclusions that you arrive at. One is, of course, the cases where security taxes on elites were adopted at various levels, perhaps. And we're talking about Colombia, Costa Rica, Honduras, and also some parts of Mexico, I think, at the local level. And then there were cases where taxes were first defeated politically in the legislature, but subsequently approved, as in El Salvador. And then in Guatemala, it was discussed, but later abandoned. And in the rest of the region, it wasn't discussed at all. So tell us a bit about these variations. What explained the fact that in Colombia, Costa Rica, Honduras, and parts of Mexico, the security taxes were actually adopted, whereas it was less successful elsewhere? So so thank you for that question. And, and I think in the first step is whether this window of opportunity presents, right? So the first step in the sequence. And there are certainly countries in Latin America that it would be hard to say that they're going through this this major crisis of public safety. And even in places like, say, Brazil, Brazil's homicide rate per 100,000 people is of about 23, 24, which puts it sort of middle of the road for Latin America. And even in a place like Brazil, you know, this figure, a 24 homicides per 100,000 people, masks a lot of variation inside Brazil. So places like Sao Paulo or Rio, where a lot of the elites, the economic elites live, you know, actually violent crime may be high, but is declining or has been gradually declining over time. And, you know, there's no real sense that things are getting worse, that we need to do something. But in other parts of Latin America, certainly in in places like Colombia or El Salvador or Mexico, the sense is the opposite, that things are already pretty bad and deteriorating and that we need to do something. So that's kind of the first the first thing, you know, is there is there a public safety crisis? Yes or not. And, you know, what constitutes a real crisis? Many people disagree. But in places like Colombia, in which it was just so difficult to travel from one city to the next, in which kidnappings were really just something that happened all the time. It was it was very clear that that was people, at least elites understood that as as an untenable situation. So that's the first step. Then the second is, are elites willing to give this a try? And to do so, they need to overcome this huge mistrust that exists toward the government. How might they be able to do that? Well, if a government just says, look, elites, I'm going to tax you more because we have this problem. Elites are still going to say, look, tax someone else. We already pay a lot in taxes and and stop bothering us. So really what it takes is a government that establishes these real linkages with elites. And at least in the cases in Latin America that I study, 
the governments that are better able to do this are governments that come from the right of center of the political spectrum. And this is somewhat counterintuitive, I think, because people tend to associate the left of the political spectrum as being better able, more, first of all, more willing. And second, because of that willingness, they're better able to extract taxes from society. But at least in this particular type of taxation that focuses on elites, elites are somewhat more willing to go along when they think that the government will really keep their interests in mind. And those, at least the perception is that right of center governments will do that. And then the third step is, okay, if I, if I feel as an elite that right of center government understands my needs, what conditions or what constraints are we going to put in place so that the government actually follows through? Because I've been so jaded, right? Or I'm so, uh, yeah, I, I don't trust that this is going to happen just in someone's word. And these are the important features of the institutional design of the tax that need to be put in place to convince elites that this is going to happen. Now, something interesting is that once this happens, these taxes tend to be fairly sticky. They rarely disappear, right? Once these taxes are adopted, this short-term promise is an illusion. But, but, you know, at least for now, I'll just say that typically right-of-center governments are the ones that are better able to convince elites that their interests will be protected and that it is worth contributing with more taxes. I'm reminded of my visit to Rio several years ago. I was giving talks at the Federal University in Rio and also the Catholic University. And I was talking to some of my colleagues, but also some of these elites that I was hanging out with. And one of the first things I noticed, Gustavo, is that unlike in other countries that I've studied or visited, there was far less ostentation in Brazil. Elites had a very explicit strategy of not driving flashy cars, toning down their attire. It was all about not attracting undue attention, precisely because you didn't want to be a victim of a carjacking incident or something like that. So I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, how elites also adapt, unlike in some parts of the world where ostentation is an important part of being the big man, the big man syndrome, you know, being able to distribute, to showcase your wealth, etc. In some parts of the world, at least, maybe I'm generalizing in Brazil and Rio, I found that they were doing the opposite. But I'm reminded of also El Salvador in your book, because El Salvador has one of the highest levels of violent crime, as I understand, in the region. And what is quite fascinating, the story that you paint, is that the first left of center government failed to adopt elite taxes. And it wasn't until this government formed a coalition with, as you just said, the right of center parties and businesses were directly linked to this, that there was an increased tax burden on the wealthy. Can you say a little bit about the El Salvador case? The case of El Salvador is, is really helpful to illustrate a few important points. I think one is that in spite of this major crisis of public safety, elites were still unwilling to become engaged, to, try, to become part of the solution when the government was a left of center government. Let's say um, the, gov the Funes administration President Funes had been, you know, it, it was a leftist administration. The party in office was from the, the Farabundo Martí National Liberation Front. So, you know, the, the heirs of sort of the leftist guerrilla from the Salvadoran Civil War. So there was a lot of mistrust. Now, maybe, you know, not in not every leftist uh, government in the region emerged out of a left wing guerrilla movement. But I think uh, other experiences suggest that the mistrust is real. In this particular case, I found very interesting how elites did not think that any, you know, they said, I don't care how bad things are. I do not trust my money. I will not give it to this government because I will only lose my money and conditions will not improve. And some elites were concerned that this money would go to other, let's say, priorities, perhaps you know, education, healthcare, whatever. 
But they said, those, I think they're very important, but don't get me wrong, this is not what we need right now. And, and others just thought that, you know, the, the government wasn't serious about the need to address crime. So for different reasons, they mistrusted this government to the point that they'd rather continue in this situation of extremely high violent crime than work with the government to try to address the problem. And it wasn't, as you said, until the government then formed a legislative coalition with right of center parties that business people said, okay, well, let's give this a try. And, and even then, I think the reception was not as positive as it was in other countries, like say Colombia, in which it was clearly a right of center government, because then elites still, let's say, negotiated down some of these taxes in a way that the incidence of the tax would not only fall on elites, but also fall on other sectors of society, let's say middle classes and so on. What, what I think the Latin America experience tells us is that even in situations with extreme violence, that is not enough. And that whenever governments are unable to convince elites that they have their own interests in mind, what we see is some version of attacks, but not necessarily as directly affecting elites as we see in other countries where, where the commitment is real. If you think about crises, not just wars, but also crises such as pandemics that we've all recently experienced, you would think that that kind of a crisis would also lead to major changes in how governments go about their business, but also how citizens trust or do not trust or the kind of aspirations that citizens have of their governments to meet future crises. And I'm thinking about some of those viral photos, videos from Ecuador, remember, in the initial stages of the pandemic, how the health system collapsed. I had been to Quito a few years ago, so impressed with everything, and suddenly to see this total collapse, really shocking. And just like public safety, Gustavo, I would imagine when elites are exposed to that kind of a crisis, they can't, because of quarantines, travel to Miami, they are stuck there. There should be, given this kind of reasoning and this argument that we've been following in this conversation, there would be adequate reason for them to think, oh, this is a good reason for me to invest in healthcare, that the primary healthcare situation in this country should be strengthened, maybe also for education. So my final question to you is, how can we use some of these lessons that you very aptly show in your book about public safety, fueling this interest in some countries to provide a security tax? How could this be mobilized for other areas of action, such as healthcare, such as education, such as anything related to development and welfare of people on the continent? I do have some thoughts. I think the, the experiences that I study in the book highlight the importance of thinking about different paths that become self-sustaining or self-reinforcing equilibria. And they can be vicious cycles or virtuous cycles. And there's a, there's a strong relationship between the quality of the public good provided and people's willingness to pay taxes, for example. And what we see here is that when people see that the government is both making a good effort, but also delivering to some extent on that public good, people are a lot more willing to become involved, to contribute, to pay more taxes, to give governments the benefit of the doubt. These types of virtuous cycles are the ones that need to be generated regardless of the public good. It might be, as, a, as we said, a bit harder to, to engage elites in becoming involved in other public good uh, provision, but, but they still can become involved, right? It's not that they don't care about public health. It's not that they don't care about education. And even from a very personal sort of self-interested way, Elites have an, an, a stake in society being better educated, in society being 
generally healthy. If governments are not providing these quality public goods, people become disenchanted. People become less willing to pay taxes for that effort. So I think this, this shows that not only delivering on the promise of the public goods is really important. And I think we see this in, in parts of the world, let's say, where, let's say in Norway or Northern Europe. I think there's a, a greater sense that the taxes that one pays actually are at work, right? One sees concrete evidence of where the, that money is going from. In Latin America, there's an important disconnect between the money that what pays, one pays into the system and the outcomes that one observes. To the extent that governments can bring those together, close that gap that exists, I think that'll go a long way to generating these virtuous cycles. And one of the ways that I think is a, a relatively low-hanging fruit is to rely on earmarking for certain certain public goods that might be of high importance so that people actually make that connection. And there's quite a bit of research now that points to this important connection that people will make, not only when it comes to taxation, but in philanthropy and, and different realms in which people will feel a lot more compelled to contribute if they know that money is going to something that they care about. Politically, that also helps in making these reforms possible for the same reason. People feel that this is going to something that they care about. So I think, you know, economists tend not to like earmarking because it can create inefficiencies in the tax system. So certainly with an eye toward those considerations, but politically in countries that have struggled with tax collection and the delivery of quality public goods as a result, I think this can be a, a relatively feasible and low-hanging fruit uh, type of avenue that they can pursue to try to harness sort of these experiences from public safety and get them to work in other types of goods as well. It was great fun chatting with you today, Gustavo. Thank you so much for coming on my program. Thank you, Dan, for the opportunity to be here. I really enjoyed our conversation. And, you know, I certainly appreciate all of your questions and, and thoughtful comments. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.